And see, in God, it's not how high we can go, but how low we can reach down. Y'all hear what I'm saying? It's how, how we can use our power that God gives us to lift other people up. The call of ministry, the call of being a Christian is about who you can help, not who you can lord over. It's who you can lift, who you can raise up, not who you can rule over. Real worship, real worship is the kind of worship that fights for justice on the ground and love on the ground and mercy on the ground and truth on the ground level. Down here in the thick of things, real worship is not about being so high.
Yeah. 
Hallelujah. yourself you need some help no matter what's going on to trust him more Hallelujah. around here at Greenleaf we believe in letting the spirit dictate um, normally we would do announcements and some other things, but we're going to just hold that to the end. I want to call us to prayer right now in this moment as the Spirit is giving us grace to trust God more. And somebody needs to really trust Him in this season. A season is not easy. And I want to call out our dear sister Pat Hogan, just trust him. Uh, Miss Jean Townsend, call her name this morning. Just trust him, Sister Jean, more and ask for the grace. Sister Antoinette, bereavement in your family, but just trust God and ask for grace to trust him more and I want to give you time to call names and people and situations right now as Elder Bell stays right there and we want to pray in that same spirit go ahead all over the world all over the country all over the county all over the city and call the names. Call your own name. And call your children's name. Call your family's name. Call our leader's name that they would find the grace to trust God more. Could it be that that's one of the lessons we're supposed to learn in this season? We're not supposed to come out of this trusting God less. But with more grace, great grace, to trust God more. I want to read as in prayer this morning Psalm 34 and then pray that psalm. I will bless the Lord at all times, not just when it's good times, but all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord and let the humble hear it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us, even though we're not in the sanctuary, but us that are together, social media, exalt his name together and then in the midst of that praise the psalmist says I sought the Lord Hallelujah. and he answered me and delivered me from all fears you get scared sometimes out here even if you're the psalmist like David even if you sing Goliath's fall even if you've got anointing sometimes we get fear out here 
And then he says, those who look to God are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man, this humble man, this broken man cried for some people that don't mind crying before the Lord. And the Lord heard him and saved him. Could you be a cry away from rescue? Out of all his trouble. He said the angel of the Lord builds a camp all around those that fear God. Live in awe of God. Respect God. And God delivers them. Then it says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes his refuge in him. Verse 13, keep your tongue from evil. Don't, 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 don't talk evil, talk righteousness. Keep your lips from lying, turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Because the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. Then it says something, and I'm glad about this. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. You know, you, and he saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions, watch this, of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. I'm so glad when I'm brokenhearted, it doesn't mean God is away from me. It means God scoots in a little closer. I'm so glad I can be honest that sometimes our spirits are crushed. Our dreams are crushed. But the Lord saves us. Gracious God. You, O oh Lord, are worthy of blessings always. Gracious God, in the name of Jesus, you are worthy of praise continually. Gracious God, you are worthy of our boasting because we cannot boast in ourselves, but we can boast in you. You are the source of all our gladness. Hallelujah. And this joy we have, the world didn't give it to us. And the world did, can't take it away. God, when we think about it, we ought to magnify you and exalt you and thank you in every season. And at all times. Why, God, do we thank you so much in the name of Jesus? We thank you, God, for hearing our prayer. God, that we've got evidence that you answer prayer. Because only you could have fixed what was fixed. Only you could have lifted what needed to be lifted. Only you could put our hearts back together. And only you could raise up our spirits when we had been crushed down. God, we love our family. We love our mamas and our daddies, our brothers, our sisters, and our friends. But... We've got testimony that if it had not been for the Lord on our side, we thank you for delivering us from fear, from anxiety, from trembling God. All kinds of phobias. Sometimes the phobia of being alone. Sometimes the phobia of being around too many people. Sometimes the phobia even of the gifts you've given us because you, we know every time we use them, it, only re it will require more work, more, more energy. Whatever our fears are from COVID to, to the fear of losing it sometimes. Thank you for delivering us. And God, thank you for putting a shine on us causing us to be radiant even sometimes when if folk only knew but you put on us the beauty of holiness thank you for saving us in trouble thank you for saving us in trouble 
when there are seasons of trouble. And thank you for saving us out of trouble. Thank you for saving us in affliction. And thank you, God, for saving us out of affliction. Thank you for protecting us and delivering us. And God, thank you for being so just plain good. And like the psalmist, God, the reason we can say, oh, taste of the Lord and see that you're good is because we've tasted other things. We've tried other, other formulas and it didn't work. Thank you, God, for being a refuge. Trouble all around us, but you're a refuge. Craziness all around us, but you're a, yeah, God, a refuge. Thank you for providing. God, we're not, we're not out of our minds. We know that we don't have enough, but you have more than enough. Hallelujah. Truth is, God, sometimes we can't even figure out how we are where we are. How we got to the places we have come to. How we made it through. And then when God, we really say it was your provisions. Provisions we didn't even know how to ask for, but you sent them anyway. Thank you for guarding our tongues. Thank you for being the source of our peace. Thank you, God, for giving us the assurance that you will judge evil. It will not get away. Thank you, God, for ministering to those who have broken hearts and crushed spirits and can we Lord just admit to you this morning broken hearts hurt crushed spirits sometimes make us just want to roll up in a ball and go away and then here you come <laughs> And you minister to us. Thank you for delivering us from condemnation and guilt and shame. Mm. And God, we thank you for all the things we can see that want us. But they can't get to us because you've encamped all around us. Many of the dangers are not unseen. They're seen. We can see them. but it can't get to us because you've encamped yourself all around us. And so God, today we just pray a prayer of thanksgiving because in that thanksgiving there's healing. We claim your promises today. And in claiming your promises, God, you move and there is the deliverance right there in the midst of the claiming, God. We sense, your, we sense your nearness right now. God, give us grace to trust you more. Grace not to forget how good you are. Grace not to forget how strong you are. Grace not to forget how much of a deliverer you are. So that when we come to new situations, we don't have to find faith. We are found in faith and trusting you. Now, since you're so good, oh God, let somebody taste it this morning. Let them taste it in an answered prayer. Let them taste some fresh hope and some fresh faith and some fresh mercy. Somebody got a report this week from the doctor and it left a bad taste in their mouth. But oh God, this morning, like the honey that comes from the honeycomb. Come on, hey, sweeten their mouth, sweeten their inner part. Let them know God is going to be all right.
let them have a fresh taste of your glory. And God, when we think about it, just a taste. God, just a taste of your mercy. Just, Just a taste of your power. Just a taste of your anointing. Not even all of it, God, but just a taste can change our whole perspective can change our whole way of looking at life itself and so God this morning ah God from California to Carolina from Maine to Mississippi from Africa to Japan from Goldsboro to the Great Lakes up in Michigan let somebody taste your goodness this morning Let them taste your love afresh. And we shall forever magnify and exalt your name. For thou art God. And beside you there is no other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just another day that the Lord, the Lord has kept me.
stayed on Jesus. another day. Mm. I know somebody is praising him with us. Just another day. Yes, sir. That the Lord. That the Lord. That the Lord has kept me wherever you are right there in your home let's thank him for another day don't worry about thanking him for a week just thank him for another day this is the day that the Lord hath made we shall rejoice in me if I don't get another day thank him for this day hallelujah daily bread ah glory ah glory Ah, God, kept your mind, kept your mind in the midst of all this stuff. Glory, glory, glory. We thank you, thank you. Y'all don't, if everybody doesn't understand, this is what happens sometimes. What happens sometimes, you don't have to manufacture it. Hallelujah. Kept me. High glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I can see Frank Jones right now tearing up. God, the Lord kept me for another day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Text somebody there. Text somebody right where you are. Just text them when you, when you finish hollering. And text them right where you are and say, the Lord has kept me, kept my mind, kept my body. The Lord, not, 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 a, not a man, not a woman, not, 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 not a politician. The Lord. Not, not a friend, your friend's all right, but you know there's some days the Lord kept you. The Lord kept you another day. Oh, glory. Lord, we thank you, we thank you. Ain't nothing like a real praise. 
Lord, we thank you. Only you keep us, God, to preach your word. Nobody can do this but you. Take this, this treasure of yours and put it in an earthen vessel with our flaws and frictions and frailties. But you do it, God, that the excellence and the power might be of thee and not of us. And we thank you, God, for just another day, another opportunity. It wasn't it real to us when we were younger, but now, God, just another day, another opportunity. Kept keep us in you, God, clothed in our right minds, portion of health and strength, but most of all, our soul and spirit focused on you just another day. And thank you for keeping Felicia and Cheryl and Ronzel and God and Charmaine and, and um, Corey and Mel who come out here told it the whole world Oh, the whole world, God, thank you for keeping us so that the whole world can be blessed. Nobody but you, God. You told us, somebody told us last February we could do this for a year. We just said, what's us? And we thank you. To God. To God, to God. Now you're gonna mess around and I'm gonna be be running. Cause that's all the one. Mm -hmm. Hey! Be the glory. For the name. Ah, for the thing. Somebody said. With his blood. With his blood. With his blood. Shame. Power. With his power. Yeah. He has, he has raised me. Oh, yes, to God. To God. One more time with his blood, with his blood. Yes, yes, shame with his power. Yeah, God, he has raised, raised me to God. So thank God for what he's done in the life of Yvette Flunda, my bishop. She, we laid her brother to rest on yesterday. Who had battled something they told him 30 days, four years ago. You hear what I said? They told him 30 days, four years ago. To God be the glory. This morning I want to. meander around and check and make sure we're not hearing any humming or uh, crackling. We want to meander around Matthew chapter 4. And it reads as follows in the New International Version. I don't know if you have that, um, Brother Corey, Matthew 4. I apologize for not sending you earlier, but if you have it, Matthew 4. 
beginning at verse 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil or the tempter. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Verse 3, the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil, the tempter, took him to the holy city and let him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command the angels concerning you. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him and said, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And the devil, the tempter, took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all of their splendor. All of this I will give you, he said. If you will just bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil, the tempter, left him. And the angels came and attended him. This morning, I want to try to preach, um, the tempter is still tempting. We have a choice. Yielding or not yielding. The tempter is still tempting. We have a choice, yielding or not yielding. Jesus, as an act of obedience, had just been baptized in the Jordan, and the Spirit had descended upon him like a dove, and the voice had cried out from heaven. This is my son, in whom I am well pleased. That's some kind of ordination, isn't it? You all could just be seated in the back. This is my son, in whom I am well pleased. This is my son. Confirmation, consecration. But then the Bible says Jesus was led by that same spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, the tempter. And then after 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And those of you who know Bible and those that don't, let me make sure you understand that 40 days is a common refrain in the scriptures and here it particularly invokes the memory of the children of Israel, the Hebrew children, wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. If you remember that text, it says the promised land wasn't that far away from Egypt. 
But the Lord led them the long way to test whether they were ready for the promise. It says God led them to fear and to other things. They ended up wandering for 40 years. Jesus here is, if you will, in, in interiorizing the experience of his people. And in this experience of the wilderness himself, Jesus uncovers for us a radical diagnosis, pray with me, temptations that we all face, nations face, societies face, people's face. In other words, Jesus in this moment exposes the only three tricks the enemy has. He shows us right here the way in which the tempter will always tempt us. And he shows us right here that it is when we yield to these things, they become the backdrop of every personal and political crisis that we face in our lives. Jesus had to go into the wilderness. Hebrews tells us later that to be our Savior, he was tempted in all points. Somebody wrote a song about it and said, Jesus knows. And he could have said, Jesus knows all about our temptation. They said, Jesus knows all about our troubles. So he went to the wilderness in the spirit. Now, the devil, the tempter was doing the tempting, but it was the spirit of God that led him to the wilderness. Because in the wilderness, there is this mirror <laughs> that can help you see yourself more clearly. In the wilderness is where the tempter tries to lure us constantly away from our allegiance to God. And the truth of the matter is, these temptations come through many forms, even today. These same temptations come, and when they come, they promise prosperity, they promise power, they promise prestige, but there's always a clause if we yield to the tempter and walk away from the truth of God. And then underneath there's some fine print that it doesn't tell us if we yield, then the only place we will really get delivered is to captivity. And Jesus shows us in this story how and why we can and must resist what I call these seductive delusions. And the only way to do it is to stay grounded in the way and the word of God. Hallelujah. The text, again, if I might for emphasis, says Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And the verb in Greek, ekbalo, literally means to cast into, mm, to drive into. In other words, this wasn't some gentle leading. This wasn't God saying, Jesus, would you like to go into the wilderness? This is almost as though there was this can't help it, this compulsion, this you cannot go to the next level or the next place until you go here. This is like, this is saying that 
you've been baptized and you've been confirmed and you've been filled with the spirit, but now you must go into the wilderness to see if it's for real. This is saying in this text that there are moments that Jesus is showing that the next part of Jesus' call to do what he had been born to do could not take place until he went to the place without any people, without any support, only the Spirit of God. This text says that even our anointing must be tempted. Now, God sent him, so for God, it's a test. When God tests, it's to make us stronger, it's to make us more trustful, but for the tempter, it is to try to make us fall. Whatever power God gives us, there is a necessity to test our motives, to tempt our motives. Further, the Greek suggests that Jesus was continuously led by the Spirit. He was not only led into the wilderness by the Spirit, in the wilderness he was led by the Spirit over these 40 days. The Spirit didn't just send Jesus in the wilderness and walk away. When we're in the wilderness, it is not a cruel trick by God. God doesn't send us to the wilderness and deposit us there to struggle with the tempter by ourselves. Rather, the spirit continuously leads us in the wilderness. In the wilderness, Jesus was alone from people, but he wasn't left alone from God. The spirit went with him throughout the entire time. And might I ask the question, why wilderness, since you are asking it? First of all, wilderness here doesn't mean a place with no anything. Wilderness really in this text suggests a place where you are alone. No distractions. Just you and God and your struggles. Now there are people in other traditions in this world whom this text would not seem strange at all because they really believe that you really have not mastered life, you really don't understand life until you've had some serious time alone. My Apache friends out in Arizona that I often go tell us that you can't move into true manhood as an Apache until you face some times alone. My good friends who happen to be Japanese and Chinese tell me the same thing, or African. There's certain places you have to be alone. And the truth of the matter is, as a Christian, if we would look deeply, there is a necessity sometime for us to go through an alone experience. Jesus, by God's way, was his son, but he wasn't ready to enter into his public ministry, so the Spirit led him to the aloneness of the wilderness, of the joy of the Dead Sea, and amid the Judean hills, west of the Dead Sea, where Jesus could be alone. Before the crowds, he first had to be alone. Before the miracles, he had to be alone. This wilderness is a place we must all face and sometimes multiple times in our lives before certain ministries, certain callings, certain assignments, certain destinies, there is the necessity, says the Holy Spirit, 
for us to have a wilderness experience, a time alone where we struggle and are tempted to make sure we can handle the assignment that's coming. The enemy tempts us, but God tests us. The enemy tempts desiring our fall. The spirit of God when we are alone tests to develop our strength. And if some folk would be honest about it, you came out your strongest from your place of most isolation. <laughs> you know, they often say about great athletes, it's not what they do on the court on game night. It's all that time in the gym by themselves wrestling with their deficiencies and per per perfecting their talent. I know some years ago when I faced this, first faced this crippling disease, there was a place in the hospital that I was just alone. No real support system Nobody really understood the demons of depression and struggle. Nobody understood how the voice of the enemy was saying, just give it all up. One text later, I think it's in the Gospel of Luke, says that Jesus was driven in the spirit, into the wilderness by the spirit, but he came out in the power. He was driven in, he was led in the spirit into the wilderness, but after the 40 days and the temptings and, the, and, and that he came out in the power. Truth of the matter is, Cheryl, Bell, I'm just talking to them because they're here, but I'm really talking to all of us who are listening. Those who would serve the Lord greatly and fulfill the fullness of their callings will face moments alone. But let us remember, alone is where Moses and Elijah accounted God. <laughs> alone is where David learned how to fight bears and lions before he faced Goliath in front of a crowd. Alone, it was where Jeremiah came to the conclusion, his word is like fire. Shut up in my bones. It was alone when Gideon was thrashing wheat in a wine press that the Lord found Gideon and turned him from a scared man to a mighty warrior. It was sitting at a table alone that Martin Luther King declared, Lord, I'll serve you. It was alone and after having been beaten in a jail cell that Fannie Lou Hamer said, I'm de de determined that her spirit going forward would not be to quit but, but to say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired with all of this racism. Jesus, he is headed into public ministry. In this same chapter, verse 13, public ministry starts. He's headed to face the lies and the evil leaders like Herod and Caesar. He's headed to be, to be misunderstood by his own family. He's headed to be doubted and mistreated by those who one minute say they love him and the next minute they cannot stand him. And in order to face it, he must first be alone. Not only alone with no people, but alone with no food. Not on a diet, but fasting has a way of temporarily lifting what somebody called the tyranny of preparing and eating food. You know, it's just, you just always know what I'm going to eat next, what I'm going to have for dinner, what I'm going to have. And sometimes God wants to remove us from that tyranny of worrying about physical hunger, allow us to focus on the spiritual more intently. And you know, after a few days, the hunger pangs, P-A-N-G, as subside as some of the bodies, according to the medical doctors, metabolism changes. And fasting, in that moment when it flips, can produce a clarity of mind. 
and a clarity of the spirit. Why temptation? It startles us. It ought to start. It did me when I first read this text years ago. Jesus being tempted? Shouldn't, I mean, Jesus be all, above all of that? No, because to be human and divine, temptation comes with the territory. Especially when we have a great assignment, the temptations will be great too. When you have a great gift, the struggles will be great, baby. When you have a great anointing, the anxieties will be great. When you have great power to deliver, you will also have moments of great depression. Tall trees catch the wind. And we see this temptation here. And then we see it again in the Garden of Gethsemane. The temptation not to do it God's way. And Jesus had the same tools we have, the spirit and the word. Somebody asked one time about this text, why should Jesus be tempted at all? What does it say to us? And one writer said, because, listen, innocent faith is not strong faith. <laughs> you know. When, when innocent faith that hadn't been tested and tried is not necessarily strong faith. A lot of folks say what they'll do, but let's see when you have to cross the bridge. I was a young man. I was preaching everywhere. <laughs> and my God bless it, daddy said something to me one day that shook my bells. I was preaching everywhere. I couldn't, I couldn't keep things off my calendar. People were calling for me and, 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 and uh, there was a temptation inside of that to think I had something and my daddy one day said to me boy you don't even know what you're doing until you got some blood on your preaching. There is um, this writer that tells the story. It says that in, 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 in Yosemite Valley there are these volcanic granite dome camps, sheer rock faces above the valley. And near the top of some of these domes, there are trees actually that, 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 that are tortured by the glare of the summer storm, the, the frigid stormy gale, the massive winter snowpack. And yet these trees go out of the rock. They are contorted though. They, 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 they aren't nice pretty trees, but they're strong. The wood fibers in these twisted and stressed branches are stronger than their cousins that, are, that don't have to grow up through the rocks. And many disciples have discovered that while their lives were pretty controlled before their conversion and before they really began to understand their gifting, once you really get, get it and understand your calling and your mission in life, that's when the battles begin. That's when the inner wars happen. That's when the temptation comes. And that's when we ha will have our wilderness experience. The wilderness experience is many times the place between your innocence and your maturity. It is the place from between you being just being a Christian to where you finally understand your calling, but in between operating in it, doing what you were destined to do, there is this battle in the wilderness. And the text suggests if Jesus had to go through it, it's inevitable. It's necessary 
in order for us to have the real kind of spiritual freedom in our life to serve God, no matter what society say, no matter what dominion says, no matter what people says, in order for us to get that kind of strength and courage, it is of necessity that we have the wilderness alone experience. I used to laugh sometimes, Cheryl, when people would sing, I want to be more. I hear in a crackle, I don't know what it is. I want to, I want to be more and more like Jesus. And I would say, really? <laughs> Do you really want to have gifts? <laughs> you really want to be anointed? Mm -hmm. you, you really want to have a praise? Do you know what kind of wildernesses that requires? And so we come to the first one. The first temptation we must learn from seems pretty simple at first. Doesn't even seem like it's a problem. Jesus has been fasting for 40 days and the tempter offers him a quick way to feed his hunger, to turn these round looking bread shaped stones scattered in the wilderness on the floor. Look, you're hungry, turn them into food and eat them. And, and it is within Jesus' power. Cut all the other mics off except this one. It is within Jesus' power. And he is very hungry. After 40 days. And remember, I said there comes a point in fasting where the hunger pangs stop. But then there's a the point in fasting where the hunger pain return. And if you don't eat, then starvation and death take hold quickly. And this is the temptation in this moment to, to meet a legitimate physical need. There shouldn't be any problem with that, right? You're hungry. You got the power to do it. And so the tempter says, look, prove you're God's son. And this is how you prove you're God's son. Grab what you can for yourself. Take care of you. And that's the temptation. Because we cannot allow the proof of our being children of God being based on what we have. Because that would mean the slave masters who had it all were of God and the slaves were not. If, if, if what we have is the proof that I'm the son of God, or I'm, I'm one of God's children, then that would mean that the greedy and the exorbitant wealthy like Trump are of God and the workers he didn't pay and the people he locked up in cages are not of God. The temptation here is to make what we have be the judge of our relationship with God and to use whatever power God gives us only to take care of ourselves. And this cannot be it is not how we understand by this love. All men shall know you're my disciples. Love, truth, grace, serving God, no matter what the evidence is, no matter what the situations are. Those are the things that prove the fruit of the spirit, love, long suffering, temperance. Those are the things. Joy. But I, I, I have to tell you all, when I look at this text and think about the world we live in today, the tempter is still tempting. Some in this country we call America measure whether or not America is a nation under God based on how high Wall Street is and how much money the wealthy have, how much bread they have. And I tell you, when I hear that and see that, I know the tempter is still tempting. Some churches measure whether they are anointed 
by the Holy Ghost by how much money their pastor has, how many planes their pastor has, how much money they have in their bank account. There are some churches that they, 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 when, when they come to business meeting, the only thing they listen for, not how many people we help, not how many people we save, not how many people we touch, not how many people we pray for, what's in the account. And don't try to do some ministry that's new because that's all they want to know. Now, how much it's going to cost? But we're going to help some people that don't have food. But how much is it going to cost? You know, we got to save something for a rainy day. And you can't control rain or sun. But it is a sign that the tempter is still tempting. When I see, a, when I see congresspersons, who will vote in the middle of a pandemic to give trillions of dollars to the corporation. Some of it they don't even vote on. They just get the feds to just give it to them. And then block money from people hurting, turn around and block health care from people and living wages from people just so that those congresspersons can get more corporate bread into their accounts. They can get more Money, you know, in the midst of all this Black Lives Matter, a lot of corporations are giving money to different organizations. And when I watch folk just take the money but don't ask those corporations, wait a minute now, you, you want, might want to give us a million dollars from your hundred billion, which is really no money, but are you paying your workers a little way? Are you, are you making sure the black folk in your, in your uh, 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 corporation have health care? Are you making sure that you are standing against more? When we don't ask those questions and just say, but, but let's get the money, because the money, that, that, that'll, that'll make us survive. That proves that the tempter is still tempting. Hmm? When some people, care, all they care about is getting all they can, putting it in their can, and sitting on their can, the tempter is still tempting. When I left home this morning and checked the newspaper on my telephone, that's a strange statement, checked the newspaper on my telephone, and I saw now that there are these 10 Republican senators that want to meet with President Biden to talk about compromise and how they can cut the $1.9 trillion that he was trying to give to, to, to the people who need it the most. These are the same people that passed trillions of dollars and when they had power, they didn't even think about compromise. But all they care about now is cutting for everybody else. As long as they have everything they need, it lets me know the tempter is still tempting. Now, don't get me wrong. This text is not suggesting that there's something wrong with meeting physical needs, food, shelter, love, companionship. By, but it's got to be by legitimate means. But, but there's a higher law than our physical desires. And if it's only about us, and, and, if, and if what we have is how we prove we are children of God, and if we, if we just think that's all our power is to just to get stuff for ourselves, then the Bible says what Jesus said to the tempter, man cannot live on bread alone by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And what is the word that comes from the mouth of the Lord? Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly before your God. What is the word that comes from the mouth of the Lord? Do treat your neighbor as yourself. What is the word that comes from the Lord? When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was a stranger, did you welcome me? What is the word that comes from the Lord? The spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, healing to the brokenhearted, recovery of sight to the blind release to the captive healing to the bruised dec declaration of acceptance what is the word of the Lord the word of the Lord is that real power even for a nation cannot be simply self aggrandizement Martin Luther King once put it like this when he was talking to America and to nations of the world he said listen here I don't care what you, what, what you, what you think be careful what you yield to because one day we will have to stand before the God of history 
and we will talk in terms of things we've done. And yes, we will be able to say we built gargantuan bridges and that span to span the seas. We built gigantic buildings to kiss the skies. Yes, we made our submarines to penetrate oceanic depths. We brought into being many other things with our scientific and technological power. But it seems like I can hear the God of history in that conversation that is yet to come. That was not enough because I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was devoid of decent sanitary house to live in and you provided me no shelter. And consequently, you cannot enter the kingdom of greatness because if you don't do it to the least of these, then you don't do it to me. If you do it to the least of these, then you've done it unto me. And that's the question that every nation and every person is facing. And you face that in this wilderness. How are you going to use your power? And what is the true measurement that says you are a son or a daughter of God? <laughs> and then when that temptation didn't work, you know, because the, the tempter is always trying, sure. The tempter led Jesus to Jerusalem, you know, in a vision. And he had Jesus stand at the highest point of the temple. You got to be careful what happens in religion and church sometimes because the devil be here too. And the devil quotes scripture to Jesus, Psalm 91 actually, that verse 11, 12. And the implication, he says, look, Jesus, if you jump off the temple down to the pavement, you won't be injured because the angels will catch you. I need you to kind of take a celestial bungee jump. And just trust <laughs> that the angel's going to catch you. And, and, if, and then when the angels kept you, the effect on those that see it is they will be startled and they will lift you up. And you'll be seen as great. You know, it'll be the greatest public relations stunt in, in history. You walk away from immortal death, you will instantly be famous. Don't, you ain't got to wait around until you get raised from the dead. You can pull this stunt. And then maybe folk will call you Messiah and you only have to go to the cross. This temptation is the temptation that is the lure of popularity and public recognition. No matter what. Do anything that will get you publicity do anything that will make people think you're all that. And if you look around, the tempter is still tempting. My God, look at this congresswoman from Georgia. She will spew any lie. She will tell any tale. She will attack anybody. It came on yesterday that she even said that when all those folk got killed at Las Vegas, it was just a stunt so that folk could take people's guns away. Any camera that's around, she'll do anything to get it, just to run for office. Maybe she's trying to run for governor. I don't know. But it's not just her. But what she is doing proves that the tempter is still tempting, and people are still yielding. Look at all these false ministers that come on TV late nights. You'll be just looking. You know, I'll be looking at Martin. Not even thinking about food. And here comes pop off for somebody. You know, faking healings. And <laughs> you know, there used to be one on that would say, Come, come at seven o'clock to my service, and we're healing corns and, and abrasions and such and such a thing. And then come later on and we're gonna be healing bigger things. Now bring the money. Oh, I just do anything. Anything. When you see those who will do anything to make themselves seem like something in front of people, that proves that the tempter is still tempting. And then there's this third and final one. The third temptation is bowing to evil in order to have authority and worldly glory. The devil leads Jesus up to a high place. And he shows them all the kingdoms of the world. The Bible says in one moment of time. He first took him up to the high place of the pinnacle of the temple to test and said, test God's providential care. Throw yourself down and see. Jesus refused to jump. So then Satan said, let me take you up higher. 
Let me take you all the way up to the summit, the highest mountain, and show you all the king. First of all, that in, it, that in itself shall prove that whatever the Satan does, whatever the tempter does, it's a lie. Because there is no mountain from which you can see all the kingdoms of the world. And if you're up on the mountain, you cannot see their splendor. Because if you're up on the mountain, your eyesight doesn't allow you to see the splendor. But, but anyway. The temptation here, though, was... I'll give you a kind of religious and political power. I'll put you on the top of the pyramid. I'll sit you on the throne. I hold the key to the penthouse suite, baby. I will make you the big boss, the big cheese. I'll give you worldly success. I'll give you prestige. I'll give you everything you want. And my brothers and sisters, none of us are immune to this temptation. When preachers twist the gospel, whether it's so-called white evangelicalism or whether it's just all we need to do is have a praise party and all that they worry about is how much comes in, the tempter is still tempting. When a person knows wrong is on the job, racism is on the job, sexism is on the job, but just to keep a, keep a job, or better yet, just to get a raise, they bow down. The tempter is still tempting. Hmm? When a politician will do anything to become the head of something, the tempter is still tempting. Even sometimes in our personal lives and family, we got family members that want to be known as the top in the family. Do anything. And the tempter wanted Jesus to just look out for himself. And the tempter says, in essence, listen, you don't have to go to the cross. Mm. You don't have to serve God's way. Just bow down to me and I'll give you what you came for. Whew. You want the world? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. You don't have to do it that way. I'll lift you up. I'll lift you up and put you in the place of power, and I'll give you instant gratification. That's like, Bill, somebody wanting to play like you play, but they just want to sit down and do it. No training, no preparation, no struggle, no wrestling, no years, nothing. And the tempter said to Jesus, if you worship me, that's the bargain. The Greek word for worship there is proskuneo. It means to designate the custom of prostrating oneself before a person and kissing his feet or the hem of his garment or the ground before him. And, and we know that the Persians did this in the presence of their deified kings. The Greeks did it before their deities and their whatnot. It is to, it is to do reverence. It is to welcome. And the tempter says, worship me. The tempter is still tempting. On the personal level, when the tempter says, just play the game. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Just look the other way. Then on the political level, just get elected. Bow down, whatever. So McCarthy goes down to bow down to Trump. Bow down to QAnon. Bow down to whatever you need to do. All that matters is that you get power. Tempter is still tempting. And Jesus knew that power was important to his mission. You need power, Holy Ghost power, as a Messiah, but it must be the power bestowed by God. Yes, he has a hard way to glory. He knows it's through the cross and through the grave and then up from the ground. And Jesus here resists the quick fix and said, I'll take God's way. And so must we. We've got to, we've got to choose God's way, knowing that in due season, ah, glory, it's hard sometimes. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying out there. It's hard sometimes. Uh, but somewhere you got to say, but I've decided to follow Jesus. Uh, 
In due season, God will give us all the power and all the resources we need. And plus, Jesus knew what we must know. The call of God is really not up there in the palaces. God has a ground level ministry, somebody said. And see, in God, it's not how high we can go, but how low we can reach down. <laughs> Y'all hear what I'm saying? It's how, how we can use our power that God gives us to lift other people up. The call of ministry, the call of being a Christian is about who you can help not who you can lord over. It's who you can lift, who you can raise up, not who you can rule over. Real worship, real worship is the kind of worship that fights for justice on the ground and love on the ground and mercy on the ground and truth on the ground level. Down here in the thick of things, real worship is not about being so high. and Everybody looking up to you. I get so sick sometime today when I look around and I see we, we took the old preacher's chair out of the pulpit and start putting in these king-like chairs. What is that in the house of God? What is that to serve one who rode in on a donkey? What is that to serve him who came through Bethlehem and died on Calvary's hill? Why is it that we have such a lust for power in the church even sometimes and rather than a than a hope and a love to use power to help people the power and the gifts god give us are called to be used to lift people and not lift ourselves oh i thought about it and how if you do it god's way it'll work out when i looked at that poet laureate at the inauguration and i said let me read a story because I knew you don't talk like that unless you had some wilderness. See, this wilderness is not about how old you are. Uh, she had to have had some wilderness experience in order to be that strong in public. It, it's a requirement. Mm. And so I looked at her story and I found out that she chose the right way. She could have given in. She could have yielded and chosen to use her gift in a bad way. She's born, look, Gorman, she's born in Los Angeles. Look at here, 1998. Lord, she's young. She was raised by a single mother, a sixth grade English teacher. She, mama had two siblings. She got a twin sister. Gorman grew up. She had limited TV access. She describes herself and says even others said about her, she was a weird child. Lord, have mercy. What do they think now? She was a weird child because she enjoyed reading and writing and she was encouraged by her mother when other folk didn't encourage. Now, here's the wilderness. She has an auditory processing disorder. <laughs> and, 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 and it is hypersensitive to sound. So the very thing God has her doing is the very thing that troubles her. Her sound and being around crowds trouble her. And then on top of having a sound hypersensitivity, this girl we just saw had a speech impediment. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? During her childhood, she went to speech therapy. That's that wilderness. Told what she might not be, be able to, be, to do. Huh? But in the midst of the wilderness, she came to the conclusion I'm going to use my gifts for justice. I'm going to be an activist. I'm going to fight against oppression. and I'm going to stand for womenism and feminism. I'm going to stand against racism and marginalization. I'm even going to speak out for people in the African diaspora. And in the midst of that, when she's decided that, in the midst of her, her hypersensitive audio, auditory processing disorder and speech impediment, she said she came to see her impediments as a strength. That the, whole, that, the, that the strength of God would ride on. Huh? She said, since I was experiencing these obstacles, she said, I turned it and I got alone. And when I was alone, <laughs> it made me good at reading and it made me good at writing. And in the alone place, I learned how to understand the real gift that I have. And now in due season, because she didn't yield uh, to the wrong thing, God has raised her up 
and given her power. And she didn't have to bow or yield to the tempter. She didn't have to bow or yield to the depression. She didn't have to say, I'm going to get stuff any kind of way I can. She did it the right way. And I'm so glad Jesus showed us in his word how not to yield to temptation. Uh, in this, this story, it says, don't yield to hate, live in love. Don't yield to greed, live in grace. Don't yield to hurt, live in healing. Don't yield to lies, live in truth. Don't yield to injustice, live in justice. Don't yield to meanness, live in mercy. Don't, don't yield to the rulers of this world, Tr live trust in God. Don't yield to racism, live in equality. Don't yield to the false powers of this world, live trusting the power of God Almighty. Somebody put it better than I could ever put it years ago. Yield not to temptation. For yielding is sin. Each victory will help you some other to win. Fight. Fight on what dark passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus. He will carry you through. Don't you know? Don't you know? Don't you know wherever you are? If you just ask the Savior to help you, to comfort, strengthen, and keep you, he is willing to aid you, and he will he will carry you through. I'm a witness. He'll carry you through no matter what the temptations are. He'll carry you through. He'll carry you through. He'll carry you through. Well, 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 but wait a minute, Bear. Well, I got to, I got to close here, but I need to say one more thing. I need to say one more thing. Uh, Jesus didn't let the tempter lift him up, huh? But there was one time that Jesus was lifted up. In fact, the one time Jesus was raised up, above us higher than everyone else it was not to be seated on a throne but it was to be nailed to a cross a wooden cross on a hill called Golgotha he was it was not the politics of being elevated for power but it was the politics of God being a faithful servant to God and and and, and he allowed he allowed them to lift him up high above everybody and somewhere the hymn writer then put it in words and said how to reach the masses men of every birth for an answer Jesus gave the key if I be lifted up from the earth I'll draw all men unto me the world is hungry for the living bed lift the savior up for them to see trust him and do not doubt the words that he said he said I'll draw all men unto me don't exalt the preacher and don't exalt the pew. Preach the gospel full and free. Prove him and you'll find his promise is true. I'll draw up draw all men unto me lift him up living as a Christian all and let the world in you the Savior see then men will gladly follow him who once taught I'll draw all men unto me I'm so glad they lifted him up ah uh, cause when you lift him up uh, he still speaks from eternity and if I be lifted up from the earth he said I'll draw I'll draw all men unto me. And so today I lift him before you. Wherever you are, I lift him before you. Him who was crucified on yonder's cross, buried in the borrowed tomb, but it's empty now. For he got up from a three-day-old grave with all power. Didn't have to do it the devil's way. Didn't have to do it the tempter's way. And neither do you and I. We can yield not to temptation. And even inside of that, if we mess around and yield, because he was lifted up, we can be forgiven. We can be restored. We can be brought back. And God can still use us. The tempter is still tempting. Yes, he is. But we've got a choice. I declare unto you today, the best choice is yield not to temptation. Instead, lift the Savior up. Declare the word of God, for he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto you. And if you get weak and you get tired, you start hurting and feel broken, just ask the Savior. Find somewhere alone. It's a necessity. And just ask the Savior to help you. And he will strengthen and comfort and keep you. He will carry you through. God help us today. Help us today not to yield to the temptations of the, of the tempter, but to trust in the living word and the power of your spirit 
and the example of your son, Jesus Christ. Wherever people are all over the world, if they desire to give themselves to the Lord, let it be so right now. Let them say, Jesus, come into my life. I lift you high above everything. Not, not in some human way, but I, I lift up what you've done. I lift up what you paid. I lift up who you are. And I don't yield to the tempter. I submit to the Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing. How to reach the
Join us, Bible study on Wednesday night. On our church Facebook page, you will find the number to call in for Bible study. Also join us on this Friday morning at 6 a.m. for first and third Sunday, I'm sorry, first and third Friday morning prayer led by Reverend Dr. Della Owens and Deacon Grady the loach. We'll see you back here on next Sunday as well. God willing and say the same. And remember, the tempter is still tempting, but you have a choice as to whether to yield or not. God bless you and heaven smile upon you. Give his life for you.